think. I don't know. Is it? Oh, you got it? Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, maybe one day we'll have Christy singing again. But uh, Shelly came to the rescue. <laughs> Just came up here, began to sing. So, pretty cool. We might have to talk about that later. <laughs> Add to our singing team. Yes. All right. So, I'm really excited about this um, message. We're going to get into the Antichrist spirit, believe it or not. Uh, I didn't expect that at all. And, uh, and so... Um, I, I want to tell you guys real quick, uh, Mike and I uh, leave Wednesday for Pensacola for graduation, and we won't be back till that Monday, so um, there will be no furnace. I don't have anyone. I mean, if anybody wants to volunteer, bring an iPod, and strut. No? No volunteers? Okay. So, well, um, I hate to do that. I, I think we've only missed due to bad weather and maybe Christmas. But anyway, so that's the deal, and so um, we'll uh, resume that next Friday, uh, which would be, what, the 17th or the 16th? Anyway, 15th, you know, you'll know. All right, so Romans 5.12 says, Therefore, just as through one man sin, sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sinned, for until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who is a type of him to come. Now, I want to break this down a little bit. We're going to spend a little bit of time in Genesis. But what Paul is saying, the first thing I want you guys to know is that the end result of sin is always death. It, nothing good comes out of sin. And uh, what you know, is interesting, and, and I really began meditating on this when Rodney was here. He, he said that we didn't, like, we weren't born and then we just chose to sin. You know what I mean? Like, we're not Adam. Adam and Eve sinned. We didn't. But... Because of their sin, like a virus is spread through humanity. And it shows you the power of authority. Um, the Lord, the reason he holds people in authority at such a um, strict, I guess you would say, degree, is because the one in authority, if, if they begin to be infected with sin, it will begin to infect those under them. And the way I saw this um, really plain was in a church where uh, the pastor, very annoying pastor, you guys have heard me talk about this, very annoying pastor, um, when you went to his church, and it's not here, it's in Colorado, when you went to his church, you just felt um, like you were part of the, the body there, you know, even if you didn't live there. Well, um, he had been using meth as well as um, uh, seeing male prostitutes. He had his favorite. And then on top of that, um, he was uh, preying upon the young men in his church. Now, how did this spread? Well, you began to hear stories of young children that were being molested, not by him, but by others. And the reason for that is that leader sin. See, leaders sit at gates. Okay? And so that leader's sin at the gate of his authority opened up this door of hell. And uh, anyway, he was exposed. And, um, and he was removed. And then not long after that, there was a shooting at the church. And, uh, and you know, uh, I don't know if anybody, yeah, two girls died, two teenage girls and so we have to understand that when you're at a gate, whether it is as a ministry leader, whether it's as a husband, a wife, a parent, whatever you're opening up, even if it's hidden, even if it's hidden sin, if it's there, it will carry its, its death through your family, your, um, the people you have influence over, okay? And so that's what happened with Adam. It was to Adam and Eve 
that they were given authority over the Garden of God. And the Garden of God was in a specific location. God talks about the river, Tigris, Euphrates, there was two others. And it was a real place. Some believe it was in a part of Africa. Uh, some believe it was in the Middle East. But it was definitely a location on this earth. And uh, go to um, Genesis 3.6. A lot of people, when they think of the story of the fall, they think that Eve messed everything up, right? Eve was the weakest link. The enemy knew that he could go to her and he would get her to fall. Well, let me give you a couple of things that are important for you guys to know from Eve. The reason Eve was the weakest link is she did not have direct revelation from the Father. Okay? Her revelation came from Adam. Adam told her, we cannot eat of this tree. And I'm going to show you all in a second. And so because she did not have one-on-one -on -one direct revelation, then she was more susceptible. And you may think, well, I mean, was that how God wanted it? Well, he would come every evening, right? He would come every evening. He'd visit with mom. And she could have said, hey, you that tree in the middle of the garden? Why can't we eat there? You know what I mean? And he could have told her, but she didn't. And so Eve had revelatory knowledge or uh, communicated knowledge, and Adam had revelatory knowledge. Now, where does this come into play for you guys? It is not enough to go to a meeting and hear the word. It's just not. You have to have your own study. You have to have your own scripture reading. I um, was reading today in my Kenneth Weiss Bible. I can only get through one scripture. Because I'm like, is that what that means? <laughs> so I'm, you know, and I'm still modeling over what I read, and I'm not prepared to uh, talk about it yet. But that just one thing, that's revelation to me. You know, so if someone communicates something different, then I can be like, no, that's not what the Bible says. And so... We see in Genesis 3, 6, it says, So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. And so, I didn't know this for a long time, that Adam was standing right there. So, the, the job of the husband is to protect the wife, right? And so he's just, I don't know, like, was there a serpent with legs sitting up there and having a chit-chat with her? Was it, you know, like this whole mind thing, like he attacks us? All I know is Adam should have known by the uh, close proximity of the tree that something was up. And instead of stopping her, whenever she gave him a piece of fruit to eat, he took it. Hers was deception, his was rebellion. And so the thing is, is that, and, and I, I pondered this, I don't know if, for a fact, but if Adam hadn't have eaten, what would have happened? Because it was Adam who was supposed to keep the garden. Look over in Genesis 2, 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. The Lord planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. Now, if you notice here, Eve's not even here yet. Adam was formed outside of the garden and placed within it, okay? And out of the ground, the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Have you ever wondered why they weren't attracted to the tree of life? They're both right in the center of the garden. What was it about the tree of knowledge of good and evil? There's one secret for the Lord. A lot of the times, the things that he's wanting you to go after are obscure and hidden and not attractive. I'm going to give you guys a story. I've heard, some of y'all have heard this. Have any of you ever had an open vision? Like everything disappears. Okay. Well, I'm driving, and that happens. <laughs> okay, so I'm driving down Norris to Pleasant Hill Highway, and I don't see, there's nothing, I'm driving and everything disappears. And it was kind of a funny conversation because the Lord says, I need you to go into um, Satan's territory and take back a couple things. I was like, no, no, I know what that means. You know, I'm going to go in there and I'm going to be attacked 
Because I'm on his trip, I, no, you can go ahead and send someone else. I'm not interested. And, uh, and there was just silence. And I don't like when he does that because then I you know, feel bad. Okay, I'll go. And so right when I said that, all of a sudden everything disappears. I'm in this cave. And it, it was like, um, it was kind of dark. And there were like bat looking things on the ceiling kind of hanging down. But I knew there were watchers. And they had like red eyes. And I'm like, looking, because it's real. Like I see it with my eyes. And I'm looking like, hmm. And so I'm trying to sneak in there, you know, so they don't get alerted. And then on the right hand side, it was like, you know, those trophy uh, containers, you know, they had at schools. Uh, there was a trophy thing. And then on the left hand side, there were like these shells cut out of the walls of the cave and they had different fabric garments folded up. And so I'm like, hmm. And I'm looking around and then I got mad because when I went over to see what was in the trophy case, it was things the enemy had stolen from the church, like the gift of healing, you know, the sword, just a justice, things like that. And then I was like, well, what are these things over here? And he said, well, these are some of the mantles that the enemy has stolen. And uh, so he said, I want you to get the sword of justice. And so I went over there and kind of opened me in the door, grabbed it, and kind of hiding. And then I went over to this side and said, okay, which mantle? And I saw this one that was uh, many colors. It was really neat. Kind of had an idea it was Joseph's. Um, and I was attracted to that one. But he said, no, 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 that's not the one I want you to get. It's this one. And it was on top of Joseph. Kind of like towels, you know, on top of each other. It's on top of Joseph's. And it was the drabest, plainest, ugliest brown mantle ever. <laughs> I'm like, uh, really, that one? You know, I'm a girl. I kind of like something a little more fashionable, you know. Was, and so I'm like, well, what is this? And he said, this is David's mantle. I would have never ever picked that one. And it's the same thing with this tree situation. There was something that was more pleasant to the eye on the tree of knowledge of good and evil than the tree of life. Now remember last week we learned the tree of life is the cross of life, right? The cross isn't attractive. And so he plants these trees. Now go down to verse 15. So this is just uh, Adam in here right now. And it says, The Lord took the man, and he put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. And the Lord God commanded man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you can eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for the day that you eat of it you will die. Now, um, the word keep there is very important. The word keep means an object entrusted to another for safekeeping. And so what the Father was saying is, here, I'm entrusting my garden. I'm entrusting my authority. I'm entrusting my rule to you for safekeeping. Now, the only time you need to keep something safe is if there's a danger. Right? And so already the Father was trying to get Adam to see that there was a danger in the garden. There was a deception. There was a cunning being that was going to try to take the garden away from Adam. Okay? It also means to be on guard. Now, the thing with the enemy is we all have a garden. We all have a special place in the Lord. And he always seeks to get us out of it. And so even today, you have to understand that when you arrive at a place that God has given you, don't think that the enemy is going to sit back and just allow you to enjoy that with any problem. You have to be on guard for your family. You have to be on guard for your health and relationships and things like that. And so here he is in this garden. He's been given his assignment. Now look uh, at verse 18. You know, I'm sorry. Let me, I thought I had this on. <laughs> okay, so it says in verse 18, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Now that word helper, this is what it means. It means that Adam was not able to fulfill his destiny without Eve. So the doctrine of, you know, women, you know, can't talk. 
know, can't do anything, all that stuff, the weaker vessel. Um, I've done a lot of study on that. And the weaker vessel means physically. Because there's a strength that men and women possess. And when you put them together, you can't unite or you can't divide them. And so Adam, in order to do his call, had to have Eve. And Eve had to have Adam. So that's why a lot of times people will get married and then the enemy will start attacking the very things that you were attracted to them in the first place. Okay? So like, if say uh, the wife is all bubbly and just fun and then the man's more serious, after a while that bubbly and fun and not cleaning the house because the wife always wants to do fun things starts getting on the nerves of the husband and it's like she's a slob because she never cleans the house. You see what I'm saying? So he'll begin to pick those things that are meant to complement one another and cause division. And so basically he uh, says it's not good for him to be alone. And then he, he takes a, a, a rib out of the side in verse 21, a deep sleep. And then the Lord conducts the first wedding. It says, uh, verse 22, he made, uh, then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman and he brought her to the man. And he said, this is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Now, when they fell, all of the earth fell with them. Okay? Now, a lot of people think, well, it was just Adam and Eve. There weren't any human yet. Well, the Lord showed me something, and I'm going to show you before I tell you my thoughts. Flip over to uh, Genesis 4, 14. Now, Cain and Abel are, you know, on the earth, and God had promised a seed. Now, the thing with the seed, and, and this ties in with the Antichrist spirit, which we're going to get into in a little bit, but the thing with the seed is the enemy didn't know who the seed was. So what he would do is he would look for characteristics, and he would either try to corrupt the seed with sin, or kill the seed. Okay? And so he sees Cain and Abel. Cain's the firstborn. Abel's the second. And he sees that either one of them could be the seed. So when Cain got offended with God, murder was planted in his heart. Remember the, the Lord said, the enemy's crouching at the door, just waiting. And, and you don't have to let the enemy attack. Sin is crouching, waiting for you. And so, instead of listening to the Lord, he murders his brother. Now, verse 14, his judgment is that he's going to have to be a vagabond. And it says, Surely you've driven me out this day from the face of the ground. I will be hidden from your face, and I will be a fugitive and a vagabond on the earth. And it will happen that anyone who finds me will kill me. Now, wait a minute. If they're the only two with Adam and Eve, what is he talking about anyone? If anyone finds me, they're going to kill me. And the Lord said to him, Therefore, whoever kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark on Cain, lest anyone finding him should kill him. Verse 16, Then Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. And Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Enoch, and he built a city. And he called the name of the city after his son Enoch. When Cain left, there was a population. The fact is, is that from the creation to the fall, we don't know how much time passed. But we do know that there was enough procreation so that by the time Cain left, there were people there. And so from the fall until the return of the Lord, it'll be 6,000 years, give or take. Okay? So just to show you guys that that's the case. Now, um... When Cain left, the first thing he does is builds a city. And the reason for that are cities are gates. They're gateways. So it's like you can go to a city and you can fill like certain things on them. Some cities are oppressed, kind of feel really, really bad. And then you have other cities that are real light and clean and just happy. That's because the rulers of those cities set the atmosphere for that place. Now, on uh, Romans 5.13, I'm going to tie this all together, but he said, For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin was, is not imputed where there is no law. Now, what is Paul saying? 
What he's saying is that when Adam and Eve fell, it was before the law. Just like faith was before the law. The law simply reveals sin for sin. Man, they had no concept. The only way they would know what sin was is if God gave a direct command or he communicated it to them. So Paul is saying that sin was before the law. The sin issue began with the fall and it spread through mankind like a virus. And all of mankind fell. Now I want to read to you the least of verse 14 in Romans 5. That's say verse 5? Romans 5, verse 14. For assuming that those... Oh, wrong one. Sorry. Okay. But death reigned as king from Adam to Moses, even over those who did not sin in the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who is a type of the one to come. Death reigned as king. And so what that meant is, remember he's talking about the law. And he said, it doesn't matter if you were born under the law, if you were a Gentile and you didn't have the law. Sin, sin. Everyone sins. The sin problem is there. And the only answer is Jesus Christ. So he's laying out his argument that from the fall, death and sin reigned as king. And he's also saying that because it reigned as king, every person born after the fall was born with a sin nature. So here's something that people don't get. I want y'all to picture in your mind one person that does not know the Lord, but you would consider a good person. Okay, get, get that in your mind. Now, think of that person. They don't know God. They're not born again. What will happen to them if they never get born again and they die? They're lost. They go to hell. Now, does that sound like justice? Yeah. Got a good person, right? Never done anything wrong except maybe occasionally lie. Occasionally get mad. Better than that, they're a good person. They give to people. They help people. And then they die and go to hell. Now, tell me the truth. Does that feel like justice to you guys? All right, here's the deal. There's a thing called the mystery of iniquity. And we're going to look at it. But the mystery of iniquity is a hidden force that you can look good on the outside. But I've heard of people who have actually had uh, experiences where they've died and they've gone to hell and they've come back. And this one lady, she went there, and I'm not teaching this as doctor, but just to give you an example. She went there and she saw someone from earth that she thought was a good person. She didn't know if they were saved or not, but you know, they're just a really neat person. And the Lord was taking her through the different places of hell. And she was shocked because the Christians that had fallen away were being uh, tormented worse uh, in hell by demon beings than Satanists. And so they were going through this tour of hell. And whenever the Lord would walk through there, the demons would flee. They hated it when he came because he's like light. But what would happen is anywhere the Lord went, the people would cry out. They'd beg on to release them from their prison. And he'd say, I'm sorry, I can't. You did not believe in me. And so those people, this one in particular that she thought was a good person, all of a sudden turned into the most hateful, vicious person and attacked him with the most, most vulgar statements. Because here's the mystery of iniquity. It's working in the fallen nature. And even if people are acting like they're good on the inside, I guarantee you, that it is justice that they go to hell when they die because that iniquity is in them and all things are exposed and made plain before the eyes of God. Only He knows what's in the heart of man, right? And so at the end of the age, all of that's going to be exposed to us with eyes that see outwardly. It's sometimes hard for us to understand. And so this mystery of iniquity, look at 1 John 3, 4. The justice of God has to be trusted. It just has to be. It may not make sense, but I guarantee you 
that whenever God begins to dispense his justice at the end of the age, Christians will be offended. Okay? And so you're going to have to settle in your heart that God's to be trusted, mercy and truth are always before him in every decision he makes. Like you've got Ananias and Sapphira in the New Testament. What's the big deal about lying to the Holy Spirit? Why do they have to die immediately? You know what I mean? That's pretty, that's pretty crazy. I was listening to my homework today. And Dr. Harfush said that after Peter got done ministering to Ananias and Sapphira, great fear and honor came upon the church and people did not take it lightly and more were added. And so we have to reconcile his nature of justice. Now, 1 John 3, 4 says, Whoever commits sin commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. Now look at 2 Thessalonians, and hold your place in John. I'm going to read a few scriptures in time together. 2 Thessalonians 2, 7. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work, only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken away. The mystery of lawlessness. Lawlessness is sin. Sin is lawlessness. Sin is without the law. Because there was no law when sin entered, it shows you that lawlessness is born in the heart of man. Okay? And then back over to 1 John 2.18. Now, keep in mind that John is writing this not long after the Lord returned. You know, so it's probably like anywhere between 60, 70, 80 AD. And he says, little children, it is the last hour. Now, if he said it's the last hour over 1,900 years ago, I'm thinking we're getting like to the last maybe 30 minutes, <laughs> the last five minutes, I don't know. And he says, and as you have heard that the Antichrist, okay, is coming even now many antichrists have come by which we know it's the last hour the mystery of lawlessness is the working of sin in the world and in its system that was introduced by the enemy when adam obeyed his voice over god's and so the enemy has built up this cosmos this world system that furthers his agenda and not only does he further it in the world system, but he tries to get that thinking into the body of, of, of Christ as well, to get them into this world system again. Now, sin was introduced by Lucifer because it was birthed in his heart. He fell, and from that time, he has sought to introduce sin into every person's heart. For some, that maybe they don't have a praying grandmother, they don't have a praying mom, Man, they do all kinds of crazy stuff. For some that have many Christians in their line, they don't do all the things that they would normally do. That's my case. I would do drugs up to a point. I would drink alcohol up to a point. But there was just something in me that said, don't do that one. Don't do that one. Don't do that. Nope, that's bad. <laughs> and, and so I lived in a, a very pagan life. I mean, drugs and alcohol were around me. I didn't have any grid for God or church or anything like that, but I had a praying grandma. And because of her prayers, I was born again at the age of 16. But do you know there are some family lines that do not have Christians in them? And here's another thing. The enemy's very crafty. Do any of you know why Hitler killed 11 million people, 6 million of them Jews? Do y'all know why? Yeah, an antichrist spirit, we got offended. Offense, people. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can you believe that? Mm -hmm. 11 million people because he was offended. Mm -hmm. So, we don't want to be ignorant of the enemy's wiles. Alright? Now, the lawlessness began to pass through many women. Some translations cause, call this the mystery of lawlessness. Now listen to this. The hidden principle of rebellion against constituted authority already at work in the world it also says a conspiracy of revolt is already at work. And so here's what John said. Actually, from the beginning of the fall all the way through mankind's history, there's been antichrist. 
And so like you know the phrase where the Lord says when you see the abomination of desolation, don't even go back to your house. Don't, you know, just get out of <coughs> Jerusalem. Get out of Israel immediately. Well, they would have known what he was talking about because there was an Antichrist spirit manifesting through a Syrian king named Antiochus Epiphanes. And Epiphany means God manifested. That's what he liked to be called. The Jews um, kind of played on that.